Hello and welcome to Publishing Insight, an interview podcast about working in publishing. I'm Flavia, your host, and in this episode I interview Phoebe Morgan, Editorial Director at HarperCollins UK. We talk about her career path and how her approach as an editor varies when working on different genres. Phoebe also gives brilliant advice for those applying to entry-level positions in publishing as well as for those trying to advance their career. We also discuss her writing career, how to manage a side hustle alongside a full-time job and how she thinks the publishing industry has evolved in the past few years. For any comments or feedback, you can write me an email at publishinginside at gmail.com or get in touch on Twitter and Instagram at flamflam91, F-L-A-M, F-L-A-M, 91. Publishing Insight is an independent project, so if you like to support it, you can donate on Coffee, subscribe on your favorite podcast app and leave a review. All the links mentioned are in the description box of the podcast and on my website www.publishing-insight.com Happy listening! Hello and welcome to a new episode of Publishing Insight. Today my guest is Phoebe Morgan, Editorial Director at HarperCollins UK and specifically Harper Fiction and Avon. Thank you very much for joining me on the podcast today, Phoebe. It's really a pleasure for me. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll start with the first question. Can you tell us about your academic and career path so far? Yes, of course. So I had a fairly traditional um, career path to publishing, which was that I studied English uh, at school and then at university. I went to university up in Leeds in Yorkshire and did um, a degree in English language and literature. After that, I took a bit of a strange turn for me, which is that I went into journalism. I trained as a newspaper reporter uh, in London and decided uh, to get a, to try to get a job on a local newspaper. I ended up working uh, as a journalist for just under a year, really not very long at all, because I have to say I was not very good at it. Uh, and during that time, I decided that actually I, I, I'd sort of gone down the wrong path a little bit in terms of what I actually wanted to do was uh, was publishing and, and books. You know, I think rather than the news reporting that I was doing, which was very much focused on court reporting and um, you know, I suppose more serious journalism, but mixed in with local news stories about cats stuck up trees and local elections and that kind of thing, which just wasn't really where my passion lay. I thought, actually, you know, how can I apply similar skills that I've picked up in my degree to something that's a bit more lasting and something that I feel more passionately about? Um, and so the answer was for me, books. Um, so then I started to look at publishing jobs. Uh, I was working full time as a journalist at that point so it was quite difficult to apply for publishing roles as an assistant whilst holding down a full-time journalism job because I didn't have the money to to quit my job and pursue publishing I kind of just had to do both Um, and eventually after applying for quite a fair few jobs I got a role as a publishing assistant at Octopus Books which is a non-fiction publisher it's part of Hachette so one of the big five publishers and it kind of went from there, really. I worked at Octopus for a couple of years, which I absolutely loved. It was a really, really nice place to work and made me very sure that I had done the right thing in moving into publishing. Uh, and then I moved to HarperCollins. Um, I got a job there working in fiction as a fiction editor. Um, I then stayed at HarperCollins for a few years. And uh, last year, the year before, I did a maternity cover at Orion Books, which is another division of Hachette. Again, fiction. Um, and I worked, yeah, covering a map leave there. So again, working on fiction and acquiring. And towards the end of that process, I got offered a role back at Harper Collins, doing a slightly different job. Um, and I decided to take that because it was um, a permanent role. And it was actually really interesting for me because I found that I missed Harper Collins quite a lot um, during my time 
At Orion, although they're both brilliant companies and I really enjoyed both places, um, it felt as though Harper was um, the kind of place where I had grown up and, and it was the place where I wanted to kind of continue my career. Um, so I was very lucky to get a role working there again. Um, so that's where I am now and I work across two divisions, um, Harper Fiction, as you mentioned, which is a, a kind of mainly commercial fiction with a little bit more of a literary leaning sometimes uh, and I focus on crime and thrillers so working with a range of authors from uh, thrillers to mysteries to suspense and police procedural novels we publish people like Stuart McBride, um, Abigail Dean who is a new acquisition that I'm publishing next spring um, a whole range of authors all within the crime and thriller bracket uh, and then I also work across Avon, which is a commercial division. Um, I'm the divisional head of Avon at the minute, so I manage the editorial team and the marketing team. And we publish um, authors like C.L. Taylor, Helen Fields, who are both um, crime authors, but then also on the more uplifting end of the spectrum as well. We publish what publishing sort of still terms women's fiction, which is maybe everything from uplifting fiction to historical time slip fiction or saga, um, romantic comedies, um, so a little bit on the lighter end of the spectrum as well. Um, so I publish into both those divisions and um, work closely with a uh, list of authors um, across both of those uh, imprints. That's really interesting. Thank you very much for sharing your story uh, with us. And what does a typical day as editorial director at uh, HarperCollins UK look like? So it can really vary. At the moment, it's extremely varied because uh, we're recording this at the time of the 2020 lockdown. Um, so we are all working from home. Um, in a non-lockdown day, I work in an office in London Bridge. Uh, and I manage, as I said, a team. So I'm responsible for the kind of progress of the Avon division. And so some of my time will be spent thinking about our budgets, thinking about our forward publishing plans, thinking about how we're going to make our books a success. Um, some of the time will be spent liaising with my team. So in meetings, so we have an editorial meeting every week where we discuss new submissions and talk about what we're looking for. Uh, we also have a production meeting where we might check whether our books are on track to meet the critical path, so basically to get printed on time. We have a cover art meeting where we discuss book jackets um, and many other meetings in between. Um, and then a lot of the time as well is spent directly liaising with my authors. So I speak to most of my authors pretty regularly. So that might be talking about their edits or it might be showing them their cover, discussing their marketing plans. Um, maybe just sort of day to day little things that come up in the publishing process. Um, and then uh, and then some of the time as well is spent doing the actual editing. Um, that sort of tends to be something that is you need slightly longer periods of time to do. So I work quite quite hands on in quite a hands on way with my author's manuscripts. So that might take a, a fair few hours to really sit down and, and read their manuscript and go through it and you know discuss the changes with them and make my comments and write an editorial letter. Um, so that does take up quite a quite a bit of time in a typical day as well. Um, at the minute, as I said, because we're all working from home, everything's being done remotely. So we're using Microsoft Teams, which has actually been really great. And we're conducting the majority of our meetings as we normally do. Um, which I think is important because it means that we don't feel as isolated. You know, I get to see my team every day and we get to feel connected to each other and to our authors as much as we possibly can. And um, we're just sort of trying to do our best to to make it through this period, um, you know, stay sane and hopefully we'll come out the other side sooner rather than later. Um, the other part of my job, I would say, is reading. So that is a mixture between reading the authors that are already on my list and reading their new books and then reading authors that are not yet acquired. So that might be when, when an agent sends me a manuscript and says, you know, would you be interested in buying this? Here's the pitch, here's the author. Um, and those are what we call submissions. So we get quite a lot of those. And I, to be honest, I end up reading those outside of working hours. So we might read them at the weekends or after work. It's quite difficult to fit in um, submission reading during the day, but it is a really impar important part of the job because, you know, that's how we acquire new authors and bring them to the list. Um, but as I say, that's, that's usually done slightly outside of the working day. That's all really fascinating. Thank you very much. And can you identify one or more defining moments in your career? 
So I think probably a big defining moment would be when I moved into fiction. So as I said, I worked at Octopus, which was in nonfiction, which I did really enjoy, but I always had this dream to be a fiction publisher. And so when the role at HarperCollins came up, I applied without necessarily thinking that I would get it. Um, and when I when I was offered the role, it, I think that was a really quite a big turning point for me because it meant that I had been able to kind of put my foot in the door of fiction and to be able to to move towards the area of publishing that I wanted to be in and where I wanted to stay. Uh, so for me, that has been the biggest point. And although I've done a little bit more nonfiction publishing when I was at Orion, like a very tiny bit, and it is something that interests me. And I think, you know, there is a huge demand for nonfiction. For me, my passion is always stories. Um, and you know the imaginative world rather than the real one uh, so I feel very lucky to be given the chance to to continue um, working in fiction. Absolutely thank you very much and which different roles can we usually find in an editorial team or department and what are the different responsibilities which characterize each role? Sure so it kind of varies between imprints um, the usual structure of publishing might be that you have an editorial assistant or a publishing assistant and they are responsible for many things. They're a very invaluable part of the process and they might be the ones that are taking minutes in meetings, they might be fielding open submissions, they might be desk editing titles. So a lot of my titles, um, I'll ask our brilliant editorial assistant to put them into production for me. So she will take care of like the prelims and the end matter and liaising with the production team about the printing and the timing. Um, so. They, you know, and they also liaise with the copy editors and the proofreaders. So a lot of that more desk editing um, side of things is often done by the assistant. Um, then there's usually an assistant editor, which is kind of one rung up from the editorial assistant. And they might be similar, but they might begin to take on their own authors. They might be shadowing the other editors. So gaining as much editorial experience as they can whilst assisting the team in general. And then you might have um, a couple of editors, you might have commissioning editors and their role will be to commission new work whilst kind of similar to, to what I do now in terms of having a list of authors that are already on their list, but then um, the onus is on a commissioning editor to, to buy new books as well and to bring new authors to the business. Um, and then you would have an editorial director who might be in charge of the team. Um, and then you could have a publisher or publishing director. It kind of depends how big the team is. Um, and it you know the, the editorial team is then supported and you know works in conjunction with the marketing team and the publicity team the design team production team the sales team there's a lot of different parts that go into a publishing house and they're all so important when it comes to making a book I think a lot of the time you sort of think of publishing as being an author and an editor and that's it and that's very much not the case um you know we're all very very reliant on each other and I think it, it definitely takes a team of people to get a book onto a shelf, um, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And as you mentioned earlier, during your career, you have worked on many different genres across both fiction and non-fiction. How does your work and approach as an editor vary from one to the other? For example, when dealing with a romantic comedy versus a crime book and when dealing with fiction versus non-fiction? Uh, so it's a good question. I think, I mean, editing nonfiction is quite different from fiction. Um, so when I worked in nonfiction, I was working on um, a lot of cookery books and mind, body, spirit books, um, the occasional biography. And so you kind of, I used to approach them in a, a much more analytical way, I think. So quite often, you know, if, for example, a recipe book, you're having to really check that the recipes are all correct and you're having to think about the layout on the page and you're having to take into account the photographs or the illustrations that might accompany the recipe um, so it's kind of a lot more practical in that sense um, when you're working on fiction I think a lot of it is is a little bit more intuitive so you're working with quite often uh, you know a hundred thousand word manuscript very much black and white text that, you know it's very rare you know to have kind of illustrations that accompany the kind of fiction that I work on it's usually just um just the manuscript and you're working um you're working with the author so I think you're uh, what I do is I would normally write a letter to the author first off of having read their manuscript which outlines my structural thoughts so it would be kind of the bigger picture stuff like 
you know, do we need to change a character? Or do we need to cut a scene? Do we need to reorder the chapters? Does it need a more interesting ending or a better beginning? Quite what we call the heavy lifting side of things. Um, and I'll give that to the author and give them a little bit of time to work on it. And then after that, I'll go through the manuscript line by line and do what we call the line edit. So that's the much more close look at the manuscript um, and probably using track changes on Microsoft Word and again like picking out these smaller things that need developing and then sending that back to the author. Um, so I think the fiction editing is, is quite a lot more involved um, uh, but what I would say is you know I haven't worked in non-fiction for quite a while so when I was a non-fiction editor I was I was only an editorial assistant so I was sort of learning from my peers and my bosses, um, whereas now as a fiction editor, I have a lot more ownership over my role and, and my title. Um, so I guess I work much more closely with the authors now in fiction than I ever did in nonfiction. Um, in terms of editing a crime book or a romantic comedy, I think it comes down to knowing the market and knowing the genres, um, especially in commercial fiction, it's very important to know who your reader is, who you're publishing this book for, and be aware of the kind of expectations that reader might have. So for example, in a crime book, readers have become very accustomed to there being a big twist, or they've become accustomed to a certain level of pacing. And so I'm aware of all those things when I'm going through, especially pace. I think that's very important in crime novels, having something that really keeps the reader turning those pages and keeps them on the end of the seat. And, with a romantic comedy, it's slightly different. So the onus is on maybe the characters a little bit more or, you know, the kind of the expectations the reader might have around a romantic comedy, for example. Are they going to hope that those characters get together at the end? Are they going to hope for a happy ending? And a lot of the time you have to think about how do you want the reader to feel at the end of the novel? So do you want them to feel uplifted by it? Do you want them to feel scared by it? Do you want them to feel shocked by it? And so I find keeping those questions in mind whilst I'm editing is useful because it allows me to really think about what the manuscript is currently doing and how we can make that better and how we can polish it to get to the level that it needs to be in order for it to go out into the market. Um, so yeah, it is, it is quite different depending on the genre. And, and the most important thing I think is to read around your genre. So make sure you're reading other authors that, you know, maybe aren't on your list or published by someone else, especially the ones that do well. So I quite often will look at the bestseller list and think, mm, OK, you know, what is it that's made that book stand out? What, what is it that's made that book perform particularly well? Um, and then I'll maybe dip in, read just the free sample from Amazon or just read as much of it as I can just to get a sense of that novel. Um, and that helps me inform my own editorial work with my own authors. Yeah, that's really great advice. Thank you very much. And what advice would you give to people who are applying for their first job in publishing, specifically to those applying for entry-level positions in editorial? Um, again, I would say it's quite a tricky time at the minute. Very sadly, I think because of the COVID-19 crisis and the lockdown, it has made the job market more difficult because of the, you know, the inevitable effects on the economy. Um, so I would say that it is a tough time. I don't think there's a way of sugarcoating that. Um, you know, I'm always very happy to hear from people that want to get into publishing. Um, you know, I'm on Twitter. I'm, I've got a website, um, you know, which I can link to after this. And I'm always happy to give advice um, on how people can get into the publishing industry. Um, on a, on a, in a kind of normal world, I think the key really is persistence. Um, so I applied for quite a few jobs before I got my role at Octopus and I'd quite often get to that stage where I was quite close to getting a role. So I would be, you know, the second choice or it would come down to an interview between the last few people and then I wouldn't get it for whatever reason. And that was always really disappointing and I can remember feeling that disappointment. But I'm so glad that I kind of didn't lose that motivation to get into publishing and, and kept applying for different roles and kept going. Um, I would say generally try not to be too prescriptive about the roles you apply for. So I applied for a non-fiction role at Octopus, even though my heart was sort of always in fiction. But I'm very glad that I did that because my experience in non-fiction has meant that I was able to segue into fiction later. And quite often, once you have a foot in the door in publishing, it is easier than you think to move across. I would say don't be too worried about being in a specific publishing house or a specific imprint. Obviously, if you have one that you absolutely love, then do apply, but don't only apply for one role in one house with one list of authors because you're just making it a lot harder for yourself. And actually, you'd be surprised at how much you can learn and how much you might enjoy working in a different publisher. Um, I would also say that 
it's it's fine to to be open to different departments. You know, there's marketing, there's publicity, there's sales, there's all these different elements of publishing that that come together. And I do know people who have moved from sales to editorial and vice versa. And so I think it's important to just be as open as you can about what kind of roles you're applying for. Um, I'd also say make sure you do your research. So research the the job you're applying for really well. Check out what books that publisher has published in the past. You know, be able to name some of their authors. You know, read one or two if you can, and and try to show in the interview you know that you're interested in in the place you're applying for a job at. So ask questions. You know, try and make the interview into more of a conversation than a sort of more rigid setup. Um, and and don't be afraid to to find out more about about the company. Um, I would also say I think you just need to show as much as you can that you do have a genuine passion for books. And you know what can you do on the side that proves that? For a lot of people, you know, are either very active on social media about books, or they have a book blog, or they're part of a book group, and and stuff like that. They might sound like small things, but they they do prove that you you have a genuine passion for the industry because I think that is what you need in publishing. You have to really really want to work with books you have to understand books you have to understand readers and you have to be a reader um you know be able to name the last book you read be able to name your favorite authors um and i think that kind of passion um will always kind of shine through in an interview um so yeah I, above all i would say you know be open about the roles um definitely do your research um and keep going even if you get rejected um with things being quite tough at the moment i would say you know don't don't give up hope. You know, I'm sure that that job roles kind of will reopen after this. Um, and you know, we as a publisher are doing everything we can to ensure that we come through this lockdown period um, stronger than ever. And you know, books are still selling. They're selling online. They're selling in supermarkets. Um, and the publishing industry is quite an innovative one. So there's been lots of kind of virtual festivals and virtual author events, and they've been really brilliant to see because it shows how many people, you know, love books and love to talk about them despite the lockdown. And, and I'm sure, you know, there will be those job roles in the future. Um, and then there may be some now. I mean, I did actually get, you know, a message about a, a job asking if I knew anyone earlier. So, so it's not that there's any kind of freeze. I just think obviously the economic climate is, is a tricky one at the minute and I think it's um you know there's not really any getting around that yeah absolutely thank you very much that's really precious advice and what would you recommend is that to those who have already been working in publishing and editorial for a few years and are now trying to advance their career so I would say think about where you want your career to go um you know what which elements of your job make you the most happy? What direction do you want to go in? I think sometimes the more senior you get in publishing, you know, the more management you take on, um, the more of the business you start to understand, so the financial side, um, and you might find that you're actually spending less time on the editorial side. So even though you have a list of authors, that list will probably be fewer because you have less time because you're kind of devoting a lot of time to management or to something else, um, uh, kind of bigger picture stuff. So think about whether you want to go down the management route or whether you want to just stay very close to the books or try to think about, you know, who in publishing do you admire, whose career would you like to emulate um, and reach out to people. You know, I think I'm always very happy to speak to people if they say, you know, can I just pick your brains about publishing or, you know, can I discuss something with you over a coffee? You know, don't be afraid to ask people for advice. Don't be afraid to, you know, ask for a mentor. If your company, um, you know, has a mental scheme, then definitely take advantage of it. Um, and, you know, social media is great for publishing. You know, it's a very kind of online community. And there's a lot of agents and authors and editors and other publishing people that do answer these kind of questions every now and then and are very happy to, to give advice. Um, I, would think, I would think as well about what you bring to the business. Think about what you would do if the chance for promotion came up. You know, what would you be able to prove to your boss that you had done? You know, have you acquired a book that's made a certain amount of money? Have you got on quite an innovative idea that you brought to fruition? I think it's just about showing your worth and knowing your worth as well, um, and and making that clear. And your employee, your employer, sorry, should know your worth, and I'm sure that they that they do. But I think sometimes it's just about making sure that everyone is aware of what you've been doing and not being afraid to champion yourself. And there are a lot of, specifically women, I think, in publishing that are really brilliant at championing others. Um, 
so like the flip newsletter, for example, I think is great um, for, you know, they, they send out these newsletters where they interview um, kind of impressive women in publishing. And I always find those really inspiring to read. And um, so it's worth like engaging with stuff like that and thinking about what others do and thinking about what you want and what you can bring to a publishing house. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And along with your work in publishing, you are also a successful author of crime books. How did being a writer help you become a better editor and vice versa? Um, I think that, yeah, I, I mean, I've written three crime books now. My third one is out um, next month. It's out on the 28th of May. Um, I think being an editor helps with being a writer because partly I, I sort of feel as though I understand where most of my authors are coming from, like in terms of the amount of work that goes into writing a book and the anxieties around it. And so I feel as though I can understand them when they feel, you know, a bit unsettled or a bit unsure about anything. I'm always really happy to talk to them about that because I know it's like being on the other side of the fence. Um, and I think as well, it, you know, hopefully it, it, it makes me a better editor in terms of, you know, I have to look at my own books in terms of how well they're plotted and how well they're placed and it, it helps me to sort of be you know more analytical and be able to see okay why is this why is this plot device working why is it not working um because it's something I spend a lot of time thinking about for my own writing as well so in a way I'm sort of thinking about it all of the time um which I hope you know gives me a little bit of extra insight into it um and you know on a more practical level I've learned a lot from being a writer about you know the importance of having writer friends and the writing community which has been really supportive to me and it's great to have other authors that I can just talk to about and discuss things with um, and I've also learned a lot more about the things that authors can do to promote their books so like I run my own Facebook advertising sometimes and I, I try to find ways to reach an audience like alongside my publisher um, and so sometimes I'm able to kind of talk to my authors about how they could do that as well and stuff things um, which which I hope I hope I hope they find helpful. Um, I certainly find it very inspiring working with a big list of authors um, and you know I feel really grateful to have their insight and their input um, as well. Perfect, thank you. And as an author and a, an editor, what advice would you give to authors trying to get their first book published? I think this really is a case of persistence. Um, you know, I know a lot of authors who had multiple rejections from agents and from editors when they were first trying to get published. And, you know, now a lot of them are, you know, huge bestsellers and it really does only take one person to say yes for a publishing deal to happen. You know, you need your agent to say yes and then your editor, so I guess up to two yeses. But, you know, you don't, you don't need every publisher in London to be biting of your book. You just need one person to love it and to want to publish it. Um, so while rejection is definitely a big part of um, becoming a published author, it's something that you need to be able to live with and to, you know, move past if I think if you really seriously want to be an author. Um, the first thing you need to do with a fiction book is finish it. So I think, you know, it's, it's so important to have your manuscript polished and ready to go before you send it out to agents. I'd recommend sending it out to multiple agents at the same time because it can take a little while to hear back because they get so many submissions. Um, so what I would do is get a copy of the Writers and Artists um, yearbook. They do one every single year and that lists every um, agency uh, in the UK. So have a look through that. Think about which agency you want to submit to. Make sure you're checking their guidelines. Check out what kind of books they've published before. See if they might be the right fit for you and then start approaching them. Uh, so, so that's if you want to kind of get a traditional deal because then your agent would, would send it out to editors further down the line. There are a lot of publishers that are open to unsolicited manuscripts now, so you don't need to have an agent. We have recently opened up to that at Avon, so we're taking um, manuscripts from, from anyone. You don't have to have an agent to submit. And so all the details for that are on our website, which is avonbooks.co.uk. Uh, so there is that route available as well, and there's a couple of other publishers that are in the same position. So I think it all comes down to, to what you want, you know, whether you're happy to go without an agent or whether you do want an agent. Um, and I think it's about, you know, being practical about it, not getting not getting deterred by rejection. Um, and, you know, if the first book doesn't sell, then, then you have to write another one. It, I know many authors publish their second, third, fourth books. It's not always the debut novel that sells. And so if you feel as though the first one hasn't resonated in the way you hoped, it's really important just to try again to write another book learn from it, write, write a better book if you can, um, and definitely, above all, don't give up. 
Perfect. Thank you very much. And any time management tips for other writers who are working on a novel alongside a full-time job as you do, or for anyone juggling a day job and a side hustle? Um, well, it's just a tricky one, especially in lockdown, because um, I do find my work life and my writing life, you know, and your personal life become more blurry when you're not leaving the house. Um, my general rule is I try to do things um, as quickly as I can when they come in. So for me, it doesn't work for everyone, but for me, I try to um, reply to emails quite quickly if I'm at work. Um, and I try to deal with things head on rather than making a list to do them later because I that's just the way my brain works. I prefer to tackle things quite quickly if I possibly can. If there are things that I need to do later, obviously I'll make a list and come back to them. But I'm quite aware of deadlines and timings and I try to yeah address things as, as quick as fast. Um, with the writing, I try to do that at the weekends. So I stick to um, the weekends to write my own novels. And I, I find that works for the most part, because if I can have an uninterrupted weekend, which I have at the minute because no one's allowed out, um, I can get quite a bit of writing done. Whereas if I try to write after work, especially after a normal day, so after I've commuted, that is quite difficult because I get a lot more tired after a full day of work and my brain is much slower and I will be much less productive. Whereas if I can set aside a Saturday or something, I can I can get a lot more words on the page. Um, so, I mean, for me, I suppose, because I really enjoy both of my jobs. I, I love working at Harper Collins as an editor and I love being a writer. So I think um, it's finding something that you enjoy. So whether that's a side hustle that you're doing for passion or you're doing for money you know find out what it is that you love about it and then use that as your motivation and then hopefully it won't feel like work like if I'm honest I don't although sometimes obviously there are things in a working day that are a struggle overall it makes me really happy so I don't find it too difficult um but I think it's 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 just as, as well it's about like being kind to yourself and being realistic. I mean, I'm not one of those people who says I have to write two thousand words a day or I have to write every day or anything like that. I don't write every day. I write at the weekends, sometimes in the week if I can. Um, but if there's a day where I just wanna watch T V or I wanna do something else or exercise, then that's fine. Like you don't you don't have to write every day. And I think sometimes putting yourself under the pressure to do so isn't helpful you've got to find a routine that works for you and whether that's writing in the morning or the evening or the afternoon or whenever try to work out what feels best for you and then stick to that and just ignore what everyone else is doing perfect thank you very much what are the most interesting trends you've noticed in adult fiction this year um well i think things that, again the, the pandemic has sort of thrown things out a little bit um because at the minute, I mean, the, the books that are selling at the minute, we're seeing really high uh, volume of sales in children's publishing because obviously the schools are closed, so a lot of children are at home and their parents are looking for something to read to them. A lot of educational publishing is doing really, really well because everyone is homeschooling their kids. Um, so, so everything has been slightly skewed. Um, well, I would say we're still seeing a big appetite for locked room thrillers. So um, things like Lucy Foley's The Hunting Party, um, these kind of modern day Agatha Christie novels where you might have a group of characters in a particular setting or location and you know it's kind of a guessing game as to which of them um, has committed the crime. Uh, so they're, they're still pretty popular. Ruth Ware has also done um, one or two in that genre. Um, I, but but it's, it'll be really interesting to see what the pandemic does in terms of changing people's reading habits because you know there's been a lot of talk of whether people might be wanting to read more uplifting fiction now um rather than crime you know whether people want a bit of escapism whether crime is too dark for them you know whether people will want to read books about the pandemic i've had a lot of authors saying you know should i write a book about a virus um I mean, my response to that is, is not, no thank you, because I don't want to read that. Um, but, you know, some people might. I think for me at the moment, I don't want to read about it because it's all very much happening and it feels quite raw. So, I, you know, when I'm reading fiction, I want to read about something different. Um, that said, I'm sure that there will be some books about the pandemic in the next few years. Um, you know, Peter May has released a book called Lockdown. Um, you know, there's Contagion. You know, there have been several books that have, managed to to write about you know a fictional pandemic successfully um but for me personally it's not something that i'm madly keen to read um so yeah it's kind of a, a difficult one to say at the minute because everything has changed so suddenly um so i might have to come back to you uh once this is over and we'll have to see where where the market lies yeah <laughs> 
And in the course of your career, from editorial assistant to editorial director, how do you think the publishing industry has changed and evolved? And how do you think it will keep evolving in the future? So I think it's changed massively, mainly in terms of digital. So ebook sales, um, you know, obviously have been, you know, very, very important during this particular time and during the pandemic when everyone is, you know, stuck in the house and they can't get out to the bookshops, Waterstones is closed. Um so so I I I am I'm quite a big digital reader anyway, so I always read books on my Kindle because I just prefer it. Um so for me I'm I've always been a big ebook buyer, but it's really interesting to see how many other people are now turning to ebooks. Um <clears throat> the other big change has been audio. So audio has boomed massively over the last few years. So within my career, you know, relatively short career so far, um, I've still seen audio become a much bigger player in, in the publishing industry. And I think this pandemic is, is going to have much longer lasting effects in terms of the way we run things. So in terms of festivals, it's been really good to see things pop up like the Stay at Home Festival. Um, you know, Noir at the Bar has become virtual. Um, a lot of festivals this summer are deciding to take everything online, um, which is great. And it's also, it's really eye-opening because we've had messages from people saying, you know, actually, I, I normally can't get to festivals anyway because I'm disabled or because I, for whatever reason, can't get to them. And so I hope that some of those virtual festivals continue. And although it's it's really sad that the big festivals like Harrogate and Crime Fest and Bloody Scotland, all the crime festivals have had to be cancelled because of the outbreak. It does leave room for this kind of more innovative virtual way of working. And I hope that in the future we can have both. You know, I don't want to sacrifice one for the other, but I hope that we can end up having both. Um, and it's been really interesting to see a lot of authors having virtual book launches as well and seeing the support that other authors have lent each other because it's a hard time to have a book out. I mean, David Nichols, the author of One Day, you know, obviously a very big um, hitter in the book world, has been really supportive of debut authors that are publishing in this kind of April, May period, which I think is really lovely of him. And it's really nice seeing those kind of acts of compassion come out of it. So so the industry has changed hugely even in the last month. Um so, I mean, it's hard to say where we'll be in the next few months. Um, as I said, I think it's great that a lot of educational titles, children's titles are selling really well. And I hope that continues. Uh, and, you know, publishing is, is, is kind of often accused of being a slow to change industry. Um, you know, a lot of people say we move at a very glacial pace and stuff in the past. And I, I don't necessarily think that's true. Obviously, I'm slightly biased, but I think what this pandemic has done has forced us all to kind of sit up quite sharply and think about how we work and how we publish. Um, and hopefully there will be exciting, positive things that come out of it in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And my final question, which book are you reading at the moment and what has been your favourite of the year so far? So at the moment I'm reading Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell, which is her new release. I always have loved Maggie O'Farrell. I was really excited to read this one. Um, it's historical, so it's about um, the son of William Shakespeare, um, and it's alleged that he based his play, Hamlet, on his son Hamnet. Uh, so I'm only a few chapters in, but I'm really enjoying it so far. Uh, my favourite read of the year, I probably would say it is um, a book I've only just finished, which is uh, Little Disasters by Sarah Vaughan. Um, so Sarah Vaughan wrote Anatomy of a Scandal a year or so ago, um, and this is her second one. And I just loved it. I thought it was so well written um, and just brilliantly done. It's um, a suspense novel um, about a woman who suspects her friend of hurting her baby. Um, and it's just very, very interesting portrayal of motherhood and parenthood. Um, so I'd highly recommend that. Um, yeah, that's been my top read of the year so far, I would say. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, so that was my last question. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Phoebe, and sharing your knowledge with us. It was all really interesting, and I'm sure um, our audience will really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. all for this episode of publishing insight i hope you've enjoyed listening to it and found it useful if so please subscribe and recommend it to a friend if you'd like to learn more about working in editorial you can listen to the first and second episode of season one 
You can find them linked in the description box along with my email address, website and social media handles. I hope you're having a nice day and I'll see you in the next episode.